So this is uh, Felix Cloutier. He has previously uh, competed in the Seesaw CTF, uh, so it's good to have him back. Um, Felix works on a uh, decompiler called FCD, so it's designed to take binary programs and give you back C source code. Um, so this is pretty exciting because there are not very many of those out there, um, and even fewer that are sort of actively maintained right now. Um, so, you know, it's sort of a great tool to have in your arsenal. Okay, so, um, hello people. Um, I'm going to start as I'm plugging things in. Uh, my name is Felix, as uh, you've just been told. I actually work at Microsoft now. Uh, I'm not doing security at all. Uh, I'm on Xbox Party Chat. Uh, I help teenagers say nasty things about each other's moms. Um, so hopefully we're going to get some screen at some point in the near future. Uh, I don't know. Oh, that's a great idea. Okay. Um, things are happening. Things are maybe happening. <gasps> That's my stuff. Let's move that to a new space and put that here. Let's see if I can help you run that. Uh, okay, I think we're good. Um, so uh, you probably got my my notes. Uh, I work on Xbox. I just said that. Uh, I, I love this picture because it uh, symbolizes decompiling very well. Uh, you solve a problem and create two more. Um, so my goal with FCD, the end game, is that I want to make decompilers great again. Um, of course, you could ask the question, when were decompilers great at all? And this is what makes the analogy so exciting. Uh, I've been interested in uh, native code and emulators since high school, but I got into reverse engineering just because of Seesaw 2013, actually. Uh, and it really struck me that if you don't have IDA, you're just really stuck far behind all the other people who either have it or got a sponsored version. Um, so uh, I started working on that on April of last year. Uh, it was my senior project for my uh, undergrad studies, but I kept working on it through uh, up to now, actually. Uh, it's released under the GPL v3, and uh, I would love to make it the last decompiler that you ever need. Uh, of course, uh, there are some conditions that apply here. Uh, I can't say that I'm quite here yet. Um, it's still more of a fun tool to play with than an actual thing that you, you're going to get work done with, but we're slowly making progress. Um, for a variety of reasons, like right now, if you if you try to decompile something that doesn't use the x86-64 system VABI, you're probably going to run into problems, but um, it can still do a number of fun things. i uh, just going to go with a very quick introduction. Uh, so I don't plan to spend a lot of, uh, of time on that, but maybe it's a good idea to go over what actually is involved. So compiling is kind of like baking a cake, and decompiling is kind of like taking your cake and trying to get cake mix back. Uh, compiling is an extremely destructive process, and in fact, we value our compilers because of how destructive they are. The whole idea is that if you don't a program that does not run code is faster than a program that runs code. So we try to eliminate everything that we can, and this creates a lot of gaps in the resulting binary, and this is what we're trying to get back with the decompiler. Uh, the major problems that we have, uh, of course, are always around recovering things that were destroyed, like type information and often parameter information. So these are, in my opinion, the two biggest uh, challenges that we have. Uh, so for a quick architectural overview, you start with your program, you have some kind of symbols maybe, and then you have one step, the lifting step, that uh, takes your program and makes it, turns it into LLVM IR. Uh, the step two is going to try to make sure that it looks good, and then try to recover arguments and types from it. And the step tree will create output.c, which is what you're going to want to look at and see if you can make out what the program does. Uh, I'm trying to make FCD extensible. Uh, my idea about that is that um, you sh basically you have the hard problems, which are 
figuring out uh, recovering information and recovering program structure. And then everything else is kind of sort of not that hard. So uh, if we can just get FCD to do the hard stuff and then let you do the little silly things that your specific program needs, then it's a net win for everybody. Um, currently, as I said, uh, FCD only can only decompile x86 code um, or x86-64. Uh, and right now, the only well-supported ARCAD ABI is the system V ABI. I don't have floating point support yet, but I don't think that it's a, I think that we could actually make that happen without too much trouble. Um, so these are the things that are extensible. Uh, you can have your own executable format parser uh, symbols, sort of uh, custom transformations that operate on LLVM IR so that you can simplify code. And uh, in, uh, instruction sets are a work in progress, but I think that it wouldn't be, yeah so much trouble to get a new one in. Uh, the things that are fixed and that are not extensible, as I said, are uh, recovering information. This is what I want to be the core of FCD. This is what I really care about, having open source. Um, so uh, this is going to stay in the project. Uh, the way FCD works uh, to recover uh, program control flow structure is that it uses pattern, pattern independent control flow structuring. So it's a technique that came out, I think, maybe three years ago or something. Uh, and as it says, uh, it does control flow structuring and it's special because it never uses go-tos. It just can't. There's, it doesn't use go-tos in its solution. Uh, this is pretty interesting because if you've used the compilers in the past, you've probably seen a bunch of go-tos and go-tos that go nowhere and uh, things that aren't too clear. Uh, the way that it works, is that uh, if you have a program that starts like that, that has uh, go-tos into it, it can most usually, when they're not loopy, uh, jumping into or out of a loop, you can just restructure that with if-else statements and everything's fine. Uh, the real problems are when you have loops like that. So what, control for, uh, what the pattern independent code does is that it's gonna transform that a little bit by adding variables like the entry variable and the exit variables here. And then instead of, and then when it enters a loop or loops back, it's gonna check that variable and see if it needs to execute, which statement it needs to execute. So um, it's basically how it works for that. Uh, it, it, so it's both great and not so great sometimes because a go-to can spare you a lot of trouble sometimes. Um, if, you're, if your program originally used, used go-to for something meaningful, you're probably uh, making it more complicated but uh, I, it's also very useful to not have go-tos in your output because it's much easier to work on it, uh, especially with automated tools. Um, so as I said, FCD started as my senior project, so uh, I kind of had to get something shippable within four months, and four months is not a lot of time. So uh, I like to call this code gen and budget, um, and the idea is that I try to make as little work as possible to get uh, to lifts code from x86 to LLVM IR. Um, the way that I did it is that I started with a tiny little emulator that has a bunch of functions just like that one. Um, so this, is, this would be the, emula the emulator function for the move instruction, which takes a register structure and then csx86 uh, instruction pointer. So this is capstone, uh, I use capstone. Um, and then what I do with it is that I compile it to LLVM IR. Uh, and then, so if, you, if, if I wanted to run that code here, uh, you, you know, I could emulate it by running these functions instead. Um, so what I'm gonna do instead of running them is that I take this bit code module that I have, and I, uh, once that, well, well, I'm gonna go back one second. So the nice thing here is that uh, the, we know at that point with the instruction pointer, uh, the instructions, yeah, the CS instruction pointer should be. And it's a constant, so we can very easily inline that, uh, knowing that the instruction has, a, the destination register is EAX and the image value is 0x that beef, then you can just, you know, you could simplify this whole function and say this is what's happening. And if you just inline all the code, well, you kind of get that. Um, and then uh, that's basically what FCD does. It takes the emulator and then it inlines functions into the output. And doing that, it simplifies most of it. You get relatively clean and something you can look at and analyze pretty easily. Um, 
So in other words, if you were to add an architecture to FCD, what you'd do is that you'd write a tiny little emulator like that, and then you would compile it to bitcode, and then you would let FCD do everything else, uh, which I think is a pretty neat way to add an architecture. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, parsing executables as well. Uh, right now, I'm going to ha add some other constraints here. Uh, I only have a parser for ELF programs right now. Uh, this one works out of the box. You can try to decompile things uh, using uh, the flat binary format, but that, that doesn't get you a lot of information. Another interesting part is that you can write your own executable parser in Python. Uh, I'm trying to use Python for most of my extension points because uh, people love Python, and Python is easy to write, and it makes small scripts. Um, I Whenever I add an extension point in the future, it's probably going to go with Python. Uh, and for executable parsers, it's pretty simple. Uh, you need to have a variable that has a list of entry points. Uh, you need to be able to read it with the init function. And then you need to be able to parse stubs, like uh, for import stubs, and then something that maps a virtual address to bytes in the file. Um, something else that's interesting that FCD can do is parsing actual header files. Um, I like to say that FCD puts a compiler inside your decompiler, uh, and it's actually giving me a lot of very useful things. So uh, for instance, I think that IDA has some big list of hard-coded functions that it knows about and just gives you prototypes for them. Uh, what, I, what FCD does instead is that um, it's, uh, it lets you put just about any include file that you like, and then it's going to use that for symbols. Um, I actually have a, an example for that. Uh, let me check if I, let me see if I can bring it up. Let me see if I can bring it up on that screen. Um, I guess I can just, there. getting there. I'm just going to make that window very big and <laughs> put it there. Uh, I'm terrible. Anyway. No, it's not going at all. Is it? All right, so uh, actually, uh, I'm, let's, let's do that. Okay, problem solved. So, well, maybe I should get rid of that. So I have a FCD in this directory and a tiny little hello program. Um, it's really simple, it just opens a file and closes it print something, closes it. Um, interestingly, uh, I'm running a Mac OS and I don't have, it's an, it's an ELF program so I can't run it, but you have to trust me that this is what it does. Um, so if you just try to, uh, the basic invocation for FCD is pretty simple, it's just that. Um, so we can run that guy. And, uh, it gives you a lot of code here. So you have the whole libc that, well, the, the whole init functions here and uh, stubs that are, right now we have that, which is not very useful, and all the libc stuff. And the main didn't, reco didn't recover very well because of how little information we gave to FCD. Uh, these are actually uh, instruction pointer values because uh, it passes them as parameters uh, until it does some better recovering. Uh, but then we also have, um, Let's see what else we have. So we, what we can tell the FCD is that we have an include path over here, uh, which, which are the Linux includes that I grabbed from apps and that are in my 
computer for now, and then we tell it we want you to load sdio.h and see what happens with that. Um, so we can run it. Oh, I guess I did something wrong. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm gonna. I guess I'm gonna have to come back to that one in a, uh, just a bit later. Uh, but I promise I'm gonna wait and make it work. I, I know that I just need some parameters somewhere. Um, yeah. Let's go back to. <laughs> Um, yeah, so normally you'd grab that from, you'd grab these things from headers and be happy with them. Uh, I'll be back to that in a second. Uh, so you have the putus function that, uh, you know, you can have an import and that's how it parses it from a header. And then you can have poor man symbols using like FCD address like that. So you can, if you have a function in your executable, you know the prototype, you don't want FCD to waste any time on it. Uh, you can do that and it's going to help. In the future, I'd like to be able to get some calling convention stuff on there. Uh, another very interesting thing that we have are uh, custom optimization passes. You can use, you can write LLVM passes with Python, and then uh, you can use that to uh, make your program simpler. Uh, I actually used that uh, a little bit after Seesaw last year when Ryan wrote the Wyvern 2 program that just had a bunch of junk instructions that were actually very easy to remove. Uh, I'm going to go back to that in a second as well because I have the script. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to run, so I'm not going to show it in front of you. But uh, the ge general idea is that you have uh, you import LLVM from your script, and then you give your pass a name, and then you run that on the module. Um, and then if you're interested in seeing how that works, uh, you have it in action uh, at that address. Um, of course, uh, as I started in April 2015, and I have like 25,000 lines of code, and it's not yet doing a great job on a lot of things. Uh, there are lots of things that I could use help for, um, but it's getting somewhere. Uh, I have a feeling that if I can get some time to work on it, which is not right now because we're shipping a new version of the XDK, uh, but if I get some time to work on it, I'm sure that I'll be able to give a lot of interesting features. Uh, I'm going to go back to trying to make that thing work. Um, do I still have a terminal window? Oh, I still have a terminal window. So um, why don't you start asking questions while I figure out which include path I'm missing? Okay, so sure, let's uh, get some questions from the audience while uh, we're messing with the demo. And as always, I am happy to start. Do your, does your output recompile? Sorry? Does your output compile? Um, sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, so what I mean by that is um, I do think that it generally generates uh, compilable code Sometimes you're going to get warnings because of a number of problems, but in general, I think that it, it will work. Um, so there are some, some small issues, like for instance, the main signature is not right. It's going to be like you in 32 and then you in 32 and then you in eight pointers instead of characters and unsigned. But uh, if your compiler lets that slide, it might very well compile. Of course, there are other problems because uh, you're redefining a number of symbols that are in the startup code instead. So it, you're probably going to get linker errors, but other than that, it's it should be valid C. Back. Um. Do you have any plans to integrate FCD into like uh, let's say Binary Ninja or Hopper or Radar? Um, I don't have plans at this moment, but it's mostly because I don't have a lot of time to put on it. Uh, it's sure it's certainly something that I would be interested in. Uh, of course, I think that there would be probably be a lot of advantages in like just getting the better analysis that Binary Ninja or Radar could provide. Uh, it just hasn't happened yet. 
Makes sense. Um, do you also have any plans of like um, expanding its support for the architecture, architectures? I would like to add new architectures. It's also something that just hasn't happened yet. Uh, I think I would say that it's probably about 40 hours to add something entirely new and get it working on tiny programs. So it's not a super big investment, but it's still like a week full time, basically, uh, which I haven't been able to give since I started working. Um, but it's, I, I would love to do that as well. Awesome, thanks. So maybe I can ask the, uh, a similar question that I asked uh, Andrew, which is, you know, do you have a sort of, uh, you know, top five things that you want someone to come and contribute to FCD? I have so many things that I could just like fill up the wall. Um, so, um, so of course there are new architectures that would be a great thing to have. Uh, I actually have a whole file that's just like thing. It's just like a wish list. Uh, file right inside the project. Uh, actually, maybe I can bring it up on GitHub. Um, so I, yeah, there are lots of things. Let me pull that up. Uh, first thing, of course, I have, I don't have enough tests. Uh, I'm not going to hide it. Uh, what I test is, um, you know, I have basically, I took a bunch of programs from the international uh, obfuscated C contest, and then I tried to see if it gave a better output than the input was. Um, it generally does. When it does. When it works, it generally does. Uh, of course, making tests would be a uh, great help. But then there are other problems with it. For instance, the output is not entirely deterministic. It depends on, like, it has an ordered maps over pointers so that it changes pretty often. So the output is not being stable is a problem for tests. Uh, I don't have jump tables. Uh, external functions are kind of working. Global variables don't work so well, and symbols, and I'm working on that. Uh, new architectures would be great. Just people testing things and reporting problems would be awesome. And then, of course, if you know anyone who knows how compilers work, uh, that's also a very good thing to have. Uh, I found which directory I'm missing, so we can run this again. OK, I'm terrible. What did I do wrong? Oh, yeah, I'm terrible. I'm very terrible. OK, that's much better. Um, as you can, you, you probably can't tell, but it removed the definitions for uh, fopen, uh, fread, and fwrite because it, it found them. So for uh, now you have actual parameters and the return by correct return type uh, for some definition of correct. This is what uh, libc uses. Uh, this is not these suffixes are not supposed to be here. I'm sorry about that. I'm gonna fix that at some point today. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have global variable and global values support. So uh, the string literals that I had in my program are now pointers like that. But we can see that it knows that it's, um, you know, it's it knows that it's reading from this, and it's got the right type. And uh, we can tell that f put s. I don't know if you remember, I had f put s, and now it's replaced with uh, f right because that's what the compiler did, and f close. Uh, the other thing is that the one thing that's missing here is the the main still doesn't have a great signature, but we can actually fix that. So. Uh, if I just run uh, object dump to check the the address of main, I'm gonna find in a second. So uh, we can write our own uh, header file, and then I know that I want to include that guy, and then I'm gonna say. And then that's my header for now. Uh, and instead of including scdio.h, I'm going to include header.h. And apparently, I didn't call it header.h. OK. Oh, that helps. Yeah. So uh, and now it, it has a correct signature for main, for some definition of correct. Yeah, so that's the basic idea. Um, I could show you as well 
uh, the script that was used for um, solving the wyvern problem. Uh, I have right here. So um, the wyvern problem I was talking about. Um, so it had a bunch of junk, junk branches like that. It just took code and randomly inserted these things where uh, it loads variables that are always zero. And then it does some operation that can only have zeros on output anyway. And then it tests a result and jumps depending on that. So uh, most business assemblers got really confused about it. You could remove them manually or just not the, the, the branches and that would work. But then what you could do with FCD is uh, you could write this tiny little pass script here that runs functions, it gets the basic blocks, and then it runs on all the basic blocks, and then if it sees that it's, um, if it sees that you're low, the opcode is a load, uh, and it's loading from constant address, and uh, that constant address happens to be in that interval, it knows that it's one of the junk variables, and instead it, you can just replace that value with zero, and then that's literally all we do. We take all the loads, all these, uh, all these loads here, and we replace them with zero in the internal representation, and then that's enough to let FC figure out that these things are actually not real variables. And then you get a transform input that looks relatively nice compared to uh, the hundreds of jumps that you had otherwise. Um, and yeah, I guess you could, yeah. So do we have any more questions from the audience? Okay, we got one over there. Hi, um, how do you transform LLVM IR to C in like a friendly way? <laughs> right. Um, so it's uh, so as I said, it uses the pattern independent control flow structuring uh, algorithm, which gives you a nice structure. Uh, that's the hardest part. The part where you uh, just takes value and put them into variables is not that bad at all. Um, but yeah, the control flow structuring step uh, takes organizes all the basic blocks into nicely nested basic blocks. Not really basic blocks anymore. They're all nicely nested, like C code. Uh, and then you can put braces around that, and you're almost done. Uh, so once you've got that part down, the rest of it is not that bad at all. Um, and yeah, that's, I mean, when you have an inst instructions are SSA form, so they're easy to analyze and understand. So if you had an ad somewhere, then you can just, you know, create an ad that takes the two values, and then you just have a mapping between LLVM values and variables or uh, uh, AST, like, formulas and it's just printed there. And it's pretty simple actually once you get there. Thanks. Okay, so got any more questions about FCD? How did you, <clears throat> sorry, how did you decide on pattern independent restructuring versus other techniques? Uh, so I was researching how I could possibly do that within four weeks, and uh, there was the, not four weeks, well, yeah, kind of four weeks, actually. Um, and um, so I could either go with patterns, and that seemed to be a losing alternative because of just how many patterns you have to be able to understand. Uh, and then I was just Googling that, and then the paper came up, and I was like, oh, that looks nice. And it's actually a very readable paper. Uh, so I was able to implement that within my time constraints, and that's how I chose it. Thanks. Uh, so if you had to sort of start the project um, from scratch, is there anything that you would sort of do differently, you know, different implementation choices? Um, so at this point, there are lots of things in the project that I feel that I'm starting to outgrow, and I'm going to have to kind of write from scratch again. Uh, if I had to start again, for sure, I would start with Python much faster. Uh, I did spend a lot of time to re-implement things that already exist in various Python frameworks. Uh, for instance, I have the ELF parser that I could just grab like ELF tools or something and not worry about it. Uh, that's one thing that I would do. Um, 
So of course there are things that I know now but that I, you know, just implementation details that I know that I could uh, work better if I had to start over that I know now that I had no chance to get right on the first time. Uh, I'm very happy with how instruction sets are lifted, so I would not start over on the first time and start over again. Um, I did have to work on the AST part again from, from my first implementation, so I, that's one thing that's already been rewritten. I think that I can last a bit longer with it. Uh, but yeah, extent, fast, f extension points in Python faster, that's probably one thing that I would do. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, unless we have any other questions, I think let's uh, thank the speaker again.